hawthorn trees are a common sight around the UK, both standing alone in fields and also hiding away in hedgerows. But this is also the tree of the fairies, so while it can provide some protection, you also need a degree of protection from the tree itself. Let's go and find out why in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are into our very final episode of November, which has basically become Trees of Witches and Fairies, which is quite cool, I think. And we are going to end with pretty much a bit of a bang because the Hawthorne is one of those quite heavy hitters in this particular realm of trees that are related to fairies. And there's quite a lot that goes with it. And it's going to be quite a fun episode, I hope. Obviously, that's not really for me to say. But anyway, before we go on, I just wanted to quickly let you know what the next two themes are going to be on Fabulous Folklore and then we'll actually get into the folklore itself. So December, there's only going to be three episodes because I am actually taking a break for Christmas this year. So there won't be one on Boxing Day when these episodes normally go up on a Saturday. So there's going to be three episodes about different types of ghosts because obviously December is the time for all things ghostly. But then in January, because we end up with five weeks in the month, it's going to be a bit of a bumper month. And we're going to be having a look at some of the myths behind each of the signs of the Zodiac. So I'm not actually looking at astrology per se, but I will be having a look at kind of the origin stories, as it were. And we've already touched on this a little bit with Ephiacus in the Asclepius episode. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to be doing. I'm not going to do 12 separate episodes. I will group the signs together in a particular fashion, which will make sense when we get to it. But it just means that if you've ever wondered about where Gemini comes from or who Sagittarius was, then that's the kind of thing that we're going to be having a look at. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. There was a really scientific poll taken on both Twitter and Instagram and there was a lot of interest in this, hence the reason why we're doing it. And if you do have any requests for February, please do let me know and then obviously I can start having a look at what we're going to do for February. And also I should point out that this podcast is going to be two in January, so that's quite a big achievement as far as I'm concerned. But there we go. We are going to now get on with the folklore of the Hawthorne because let's face it, that's why you're here. So as I said in the introduction, Hawthorne is a very common sight around the UK and as you might imagine, with it comes a slew of folklore and superstitions. Its name comes from the Anglo-Saxon word hedge dawn, which actually means hedge thorn and this refers to the fact that it was a thorny plant used in hedges, basically for boundaries. And farmers would use hawthorn in their hedges to protect their crops or their cattle from witches. And some people did believe that any farm stock kept in a field with hawthorn nearby would thrive. It's often referred to as May Blossom, although it doesn't actually always blossom on May Day. It used to until the calendar changed in 1752, but this meant that hawthorn was more likely to blossom in the middle of May rather than on the 1st. That being said, in Suffolk, if a servant could find any blossoming hawthorn on May Day, they'd win a dish of cream for bringing it home. Now, I should point out that May Day was the only day on which it was considered safe to bring hawthorn into the house. And Ruth Binney suggests the practice of bringing May Blossom in came from a Roman celebration of Flora, the goddess of flowering plants. Now, garlands made of hawthorn later found their way into May Day celebrations where they helped to symbolise new spring life. Yeah, obviously, I think we're all aware of this in the UK, at least. May is not always the warmest of months. And you may have heard the old proverb, cast near a clout till May is out. And here, clout means clothes. And in short, the proverb is basically saying, don't shed your winter clothes until the end of May. So let's get into some of its folklore. Now, there are several links between the hawthorn and death. And Christ's crown was believed to be made from hawthorn. Meanwhile, its rather pungent aroma was likened to the smell of death and medieval people actually felt it reminded them of plague corpses. Now, this isn't as fanciful as we might immediately think. We now know that trimethylamine, 
found in hawthorn blossom also forms in decaying tissue. So people would have been familiar with the smell due to the old practice of keeping corpses in the house before burial and obviously you wouldn't want to willingly bring that smell in with the hawthorn. The smell is perhaps one reason behind the belief that death would follow if you brought hawthorn indoors on any day other than May Day. Although in and sleeping in a room where hawthorn blossom was on display would apparently attract misfortune. I would argue that death is quite a big misfortune, but that is what the superstition says. Yet, as with all things folklore, there are always caveats, which I think if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you'll be aware of. And if you followed a specific procedure, you could bring hawthorn indoors and still enjoy its benefits. For example, gathering hawthorn on Holy Thursday help to alleviate its negative effects. So if someone outside of the family then laid the bunch among the rafters, it would protect the house from being struck by lightning. And as ever, if you are interested in folkloric ways to protect your home, you can grab my guide to do exactly that from the link in the show notes. Now, Jacqueline Simpson and Steve Rowd also note the practice of bending a hawthorn branch into a globe and people would then hang them in the kitchen to bring good luck and then they would burn them on New Year's Day. And that was essentially to get rid of all the nastiness from last year. And they would burn the globe in a straw fire in a wheat field, which is awfully specific, and that would help protect future crops from diseases or witches. And then they would make a brand new globe, singeing its thorns from the embers of last year's globe. I would imagine that the theory behind that would be that any nastiness or bad energy or just weird things in the atmosphere would then get caught on the spikes of the hawthorn and thus keep them away from you in your home. You could also wear a sprig of hawthorn in your hat band to prevent being struck by lightning yourself and you could actually use hawthorn to bring luck to your home and what you would need to do is actually pick it at midnight on Twelfth Night and then keep it in your house. There is of course an episode on Twelfth Night way back in the archives if you're interested. Christina Oakley Harrington notes that a sprig of hawthorn hung from a baby's cradle was a good luck charm in ancient Rome and for a modern version you can add yours to a bag that you can then safely hang well away from little grasping fingers and that particular anecdote comes from the Treadwell's Book of Plant Magic which is highly recommended by yours truly. Now the trees essentially stand on the threshold between our world and the other world and we've kind of sort of visited the other world a few times in these episodes although safely obviously not actually going and the trees are under the protection of the fairies so you would risk punishment from them if you cut them down without their permission and one of those caveats was that you could then cut the branches and bring them indoors on May Day and it would spell disaster to do so at any other time so I'm assuming there must have been at some point some kind of accord between fairies and humans to let them have it on May Day and incidentally this is also why you might sometimes find a lone hawthorn tree seemingly standing in quite an inopportune place because nobody wants to uproot the trees without the fairies permission And indeed, Margaret Baker actually relates a tale of a farmer in Worcestershire who did exactly that. And he got so sick of the stream of sightseers to his hawthorn tree that he actually cut it down, which is a little bit extreme, maybe. But in response, he then broke his arm and his leg and his farm burned down. So, you know, be careful if you're thinking about taking out a hawthorn. And if you did need to cut one down, you could do so if you got permission first and you also needed a good reason. So if you were cutting one down just to improve a view or build a house, that would bring misfortune to whoever lived there. You could, however, cut one down if it was for ritual purposes or healing purposes. And Margaret Baker tells the tale of a house in Dorset and they cut down their hawthorn tree basically because they ran out of firewood. So they were using it for an actual practical reason. But the retribution spanned the whole village to the extent that chickens wouldn't lay, cows wouldn't carve and people didn't conceive any babies. So the family then planted a brand new hawthorn tree and the curse lifted. So I don't know if there is any specific real reason behind why that might be the case but it does seem a funny coincidence that putting the tree back or putting a new tree back in its place seemed to change everybody's look. Now if you do want to see fairies and I think it's interesting seeing how many people you get online who are like oh my god I love fairies and they very much got this like Tinkerbell image of them and I always kind of feel a bit hmm about it because when you actually look at the law this kind of glittery wanting to grant wishes for nothing in return is not something that you find in fairy law. They are, they do have their own set of rules and laws and all that kind of thing. And I just sort of think 
let them get on with their thing and we'll get on with ours. But there we go. If you do, for whatever reason, want to see them, it's said that the best way to do it is to spend time near lone hawthorn trees. And if you spend time near a lone hawthorn tree on May Day, Midsummer or Halloween, that's basically the most dangerous time. And by dangerous, I do mean that you're more likely to see a fairy then. So obviously try and avoid the trees on those particular days because it's that idea of this liminal time when things are supposed to find it easier to come through from one world to the next. Now this obviously didn't phase Thomas the Rhymer who again we have had an episode about in the past so you can find that in the archive and he fell asleep under a hawthorn tree while enjoying his favourite view and he saw the Queen of Fairyland as she rode by and the Queen then took a fancy to him. And according to the legend, Thomas willingly went with her to act as a servant. And when he finally returned to our world, seven years had passed. Now, he had kept his vow of silence while he was in Fairyland, and the Queen then rewarded him with the gift of prophecy as a result. Now, personally, I can't tell if that's a cautionary tale or good career advice, but never mind. He did at least still come out of it quite well. And there is also another rather famous hawthorn tree other than the one that Thomas the Rhymer sat under. And it basically marks quite a peculiar example of a tree that is surrounded by pagan belief that then successfully crosses over into Christian legend. And that would be the Glastonbury hawthorn. And according to the tale, Joseph of Arimathea brought the Holy Grail to the British Isles and he slammed his hawthorn staff into the ground in Glastonbury where it then took root and became a hawthorn tree. Now, this particular tree could apparently flower in May and at Christmas, and the Bishop of Bath and Wells was the one who started sending a sprig of hawthorn to the monarch for their Christmas table. Obviously, it was flowering at this point, and he started doing that during the reign of James I. If you have watched the second series of Blackadder, you will have the same mental image of the Bishop of Bath and Wells that I do. But the parliamentarian troops of Oliver Cromwell actually cut down the original hawthorn during the Civil War, but thankfully someone had taken cuttings, so the tree did live on through its descendants, and the botanists at Kew Gardens actually managed to graft a replacement tree, which they then relocated to Glastonbury in January 2013. And I should also point out that this isn't the only link between Christianity and Hawthorns, because according to Paul Kendall, the land now occupied by Westminster Abbey used to be called Thorny Island, and that's because a stand of sacred hawthorn trees once stood there. Now, when we looked at the elder tree last week, one of the things that really kind of stood out was this idea of the tree being quite contradictory. So on one hand, people were like, oh my God, witches can turn into elder trees. And on the other hand, it's got all these medicinal benefits. And the hawthorn, to be fair, isn't that much different. So it's also quite contradictory in the sense that you don't want to cut one down because you'll annoy the fairies, but then it's also really useful. People have made jelly and wine from both the berries and the blossom. And the wood also made an excellent choice for tools because apparently it's very good to carve and it's particularly favoured for divining rods. And I did share a superstition about people washing their face in dew gathered from elderflowers last week. There's a very similar one from hawthorns. So what women were advised to do is to collect dew from hawthorn trees in May. And then washing their faces with this would preserve their beauty. Just quite interesting that you've got a very, very similar belief about these two different trees. But men also believed that they would improve at their chosen craft if they actually washed their hands in this dew gathered from hawthorn trees. So it's quite interesting that on one hand, men are wanting to get better at what they do and women are wanting to stay prettier for longer. So I think that says a lot about beauty standards in previous centuries. Now, some have used its berries, its leaves and its flowers in herbal remedies to treat migraines, insomnia, high blood pressure and heart disorders. And it also appears in magic to promote love, marriage, intuition, prosperity and happiness, which I always think is a bit of a strange correspondence, as it were, because on one hand, you've got like you can't cut the tree down. You can't bring it in on any other day but this because it will bring death with it. And then you've got, oh, but we're going to use it in love magic. That just seems like a really strange juxtaposition to me. But that's just the nature of folklore, really. And there was also a Somerset charm for a festering wound that involved Hawthorne. And considering some of the charms that we've done on the podcast, this one's relatively simple by those standards. Because all you needed to do was get a thorn from a Hawthorne tree and then just pass it over the wound while saying, Christ was of the virgin born, he was pricked by a thorn. It never did bell or swell, I trust in Jesus this never will. So that's actually really quite tame compared to some of the charms that I've seen. But we are going to finish off with the clutie tree, which is something that you'll often 
find associated with the hawthorn. And basically what it is, is hawthorn trees would often grow near burial chambers, springs, stone circles or ancient wells. So they're, they're basically absorbing all of the atmosphere in these sort of sacred places. And people would start tying rags on the tree so that the cloth would then absorb the shrine's healing powers. And by the time the rag rotted off the branch, the healing would have taken place. Now, on one hand, that seems like a nice idea, but unfortunately, as you often get with many of these things, people have started joining in with the tradition without really fully thinking about what they're doing. So they'll now tie materials onto the trees that don't biodegrade. So you often get a lot of man-made fabrics. You might get plastic. People insist on tying ribbons. I did once see one clouty tree in a picture which actually had a bra attached to it. And I honestly don't understand what that person was hoping to achieve with that. And it's nice that people want to continue old traditions, but it comes deeply deeply problematic when they do so in ways that pollute the environment so don't just go oh I want to join in on this as well and then actually do something that's going to harm the tree that you're supposed to want healing from like that just to me completely beggars belief so if you must insist on following the practice then I would suggest a braid of pure undyed wool would work really nicely or something like unbleached linen so it's basically something that's as natural as possible that will rot and will break down. So you don't want something that's going to end up hanging there for thousands of years, like plastic or PVC, because the whole point is that it heals your ailment by rotting away. So using a material that doesn't break down is just so counterintuitive, it's not even funny. So yeah, that that's my little rant for this episode, because it does annoy me when I see people trying to join in on these old traditions, but then doing them in such a way that they're damaging, and it's just like, stop it, really, just stop it. Now, if you would like to encounter the hawthorn tree in a more environmentally friendly way, then fair enough, that's cool. I've got you back on this one because I I had an idea a little while ago to create a series of guided meditations based around folklore. Now, there are various reasons why people think guided meditations work. Some people think that you're simply encountering a part of your own unconscious that just takes the form of whatever is in the guided meditation sort of to make it easier to converse with. Other people think that you are genuinely entering another realm or another plane of existence where you are actually encountering this being. Whichever version you subscribe to, I do find that they are quite helpful. You can get some quite interesting insights about yourself or a situation that would elude you in conscious thinking, if that makes sense. So I decided to create the very first fo fabulous folklore guided meditation around the spirit of the Hawthorne, just because they've got all of these cool associations around fairies and things like that. So I will put the link to that below. It is on YouTube, um, so I will put the link below if you want to give that a go. I actually hadn't realised there were quite so many hawthorns in my area until I started going out for a walk around where I live during the first lockdown when that was the most amount of exercise you could get. And it was really cool seeing all these hawthorns blossoming in May. So that was, that, that's basically how I kind of encountered the hawthorn for the first time and actually noticed that it was there. So yeah. So we are going to move on, as I say, next week to ghosts and things like that. And I think we're going to start off with the green lady ghost. So who is she and why is she so different from other female ghosts? We're going to start off with her because I think that would be quite interesting. So I hope to see you next week. And if you do have any requests for episodes starting from February, please do let me know. Incidentally, if you are a Patreon supporter, the bonus episode is going to be going out at some point over the weekend. And it's going to be on sort of the folklore of like travel and journeys and trains and things. And that was a, 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 a request from one of my lovely Patreon supporters. So if you are a supporter, you will get that bonus episode at some point over the weekend. So without any further ado, I let you go and continue with your day. And I'll see you next week when we're going to start looking at ghosts. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.